Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our Thursday night Anamkara meditation program. With all my heart, with all my love, I welcome you to our program this evening. Tonight, I wanted to do a reading. And, you know, one of my favorite authors is Joseph Campbell. And he wrote so much about mythology, Eastern mythology, uh, giving a, a, a really a, a context for understanding the, the breadth and the depth of these archetypal images and symbols that come up in traditions around the world. He was fascinated by them, and so he wrote endlessly about it. Uh, one of his great collections is a, is a four-volume set called The Masks of God. And The Masks of God, those four volumes, go into the various traditions, um, both Eastern and Western, primitive, creative, all kinds of mythologies that inform all our religious thought um, to this day. So a great collection to add to your library and dive into. This collection of his talks is called Myths of Light, and it's Eastern Metaphors of the Eternal. And I first really got uh, deeply into Joseph Campbell's work when I was uh, writing my doctoral dissertation and doing the research for that. Oh, that was over 38 years ago. I was, in fact, 38 years ago, I was just wrapping up um, both the writing. I had completed the, uh, the, the research the year before, so I was in the throes of writing my, my doctoral thesis 38 years ago and drew on Joseph Campbell and, uh, and especially his uh, work on the monomyth, uh, what he called uh, the hero's journey as a monomyth, as one mythic theme that pervades the, the notion of the hero's journey around the world in different traditions. And we see it in everything from the, the life of Moses to the life of Christ to the life of Buddha to the life of Lao Tzu. Um, and so another great work to dive into for uh, your interest in, and be able to see the context because sadhana, spiritual development, the unfolding and transformation of consciousness over time, and the endeavor that somebody who's practicing yoga, meditation, Buddhist practices, mystical practices, Christian mystic practices, uh, they are all deeply informed by what Joseph Campbell was writing about uh, in, in that context. Uh, so tonight what I wanted to do is a reading that has to do with one of the things that he wrote about was in terms of these sort of archetypal understanding of this powerful transformative process and the journey of that was all about kundalini because kundalini um, as an eastern term as a sanskrit yogic term for the power of consciousness to know itself and to transform this body and mind so that they can participate in that knowing and serve that in the world he wrote about it because it's such a potent and clear uh, mythological explanation of what is going on. So I wanted to share this with you this evening. And uh, he's been talking in this, in this section uh, in a number of different ways about the individual's journey. And, and he goes, at one point he says, here then is the map, this is the map of the journey as it were, the geography of the road from here to the other side and back. The other side being that state of transcendence, that state of enlightenment. And back, you know, the hero's journey is about both going forth, leaving behind the conventional, restricted, contracted understanding of ordinary society and culture, going beyond it and coming back with the transcendent truths, um, the jewels, the gold, for informing one's culture to expand it and renew the highest vision of what we're capable of. He had been talking about the great uh, sage Ramakrishna Paramahamsa earlier in this chapter. And he goes, unlike Ramakrishna, I haven't been up there, so I'm going to be able to report on the upper regions there without passing out. Because Ramakrishna, often when he would start to talk about the transcendent domains, he would go into ecstasy, mm -hmm. sometimes even just falling over uh, because the, the state is so captivating. It's hard for the poor mind to stay in its ordinary state when this union that's calling to us is just 
beyond words. Joseph Campbell goes on to write, of course, I'll be working from reports, but I will attempt to give an idea of the full journey of Kundalini. The first lotus, this, these are the chakras, is called the muladhara, which means root base. At this lotus, the serpent is coiled and, and uh, coiled up and in, inert. So the serpent is what he's talking about is the, the classic archetypal imagery of Kundalini as a snake uh, coiled around this presence of Shiva, the infinite. Mm. The serpent is coiled up and inert in its lair at the base of the spine. It's roughly where it's located, though it's in a subtle body, not the physical body. At this point, the serpent is like a dragon. We all know the character of dragons, at least Western dragons. They live in caves, and they have a gold hoard in the cave, and they have a beautiful girl whom they have captured in the cave. They can't do anything with the, either treasure or the maiden, but they simply want to hold them. Mm? Dragons, like people whose lives are centered around the first chakra, are based around gripping, holding, holding on to power, holding on to a life that is no life at all because there is no animation in it, no joy in it, no vitality in it, but just grim, dogged existence. The nature of Kundalini at the Muladhara is that of Ebenezer Scrooge before he undergoes the grand journey and transformation at the hands of the three ghosts in Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. I hope you don't know anyone who lives on this level, but I do. The aim of the yogi is to encourage the kundalini to rise from its lair at the base of the spine and to unite with the Lord of the world who is waiting at the crown of the head in the seventh chakra, the sahasrara. Wake, mother, wake up, r runs a pious Bengali song. This is by the great um, Bengali uh, Ramprasad Sen, who was a great devotee of Ma Kali and kundalini. Wake, mother, wake, he says. How long hast thou been asleep in the lotus of the Muladhara? Fulfill thy secret function. Rise to the Sahasrar, where mighty Shiva dwells. Swiftly pierce the ch six lotuses, O thou essence of consciousness, and take away in my grief. Because hmm? it's pure consciousness. Kundalini is not a thing. It's pure consciousness. And it's the consciousness of the rapturous state of unity that embraces all of diversity. Mm? So it's in this constant state of rapturous fullness. Mm? So that's how it can remove all grief. Campbell goes on, an awakened kundalini now starts up through the channel of the spine called the shashumna. The second chakra, the level of the genitalia, and it, and it is called uh, swadishtana, which means her favorite resort. This is the chakra that centers itself entirely around the experience of pleasure or kama. Some people are familiar with what's known as the Kama Sutras. When one's spiritual energy is operating on this level, one's psychology is completely Freudian. Sex is the only aim, sex is the great frustration. But when Kundalini moves up again, it reaches the level of the navel or the stomach. So as kundalini, as awakened kundalini, is moving through these uh, centers of consciousness that we call chakras, it's, it's really transforming them. And it's transforming and it's setting consciousness free. Just like if somebody's really stuck in that existence, subsistence level of existence, hoarding, craving, clinging, um, it gets freed and helps release that. If somebody is caught in obsession with desire and satisfaction of desires and, and limited pleasures of the senses, the Kundalini is going to move through and release the consciousness from being stuck there. That's the purificatory process that is metaphorically and symbolically represented by Kundalini going up through these centers. So when the kundalini moves up again, it reaches the level of the navel or stomach. This chakra is called Manipura, which means the city of a shining jewel. 
Here the interest is in consuming everything, being master of everything, eating everything, turning it into your own substance. This is, after all, the chakra of the belly. So it's consuming and consuming. When the energy at this level w is at this level, one psychology is completely Nietzschean or Adlerian. One wants to consume and gain power for oneself over everything. One is driven by a will to power. This is the level at which the Arta principle, the drive to succeed, is centered. Now, most people operate on the second or third level, the pleasure or power principles. In general, Freudian psychology is based on the idea that the sex urge is the primary urge of life. The psychology of Jacob Adler is based on the idea that the will to power is the primary urge in life, and all other urges are sublimations or inflections of this. The Indians say this too. They say both of these, Kama and Artha, are primary urges. These are both inflections of that still deeper dragonish will simply to be alive. But on these two higher levels, at the second and third lotuses, there is a vitality or an activity, a joy and a pain in life. People on these levels are outwardly directed their individual satisfaction must come from a relationship to something outside, to an outer object. In the first case, in the case of the second chakra, with an erotic emphasis, in the third chakra, the emphasis is on conquest and defeat, whether military, financial, or erotic. Jung referred to such people as extroverted. They're fully turned outward. We have already traveled through the chakras at which most of our lives are lived. However, we still have four levels to go. Next comes the very interesting fourth level, at the level of the heart. You know the Roman Catholic figure of Jesus with his heart exposed, the Sacre Coeur. It is the level of the sacred heart, the heart that one comes first into relationship to the higher principles the, uh, of the powers of art and of spirit, which are not those of empirical outside environment. Once Kundalini rises to this level, as Wordsworth says, one gains a sense sublime of something far more deeply infused, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns and the round ocean and the living air and the blue sky and the mind of man. One is moved to seek that that is. It is said that the divinity meets the devotee at the level of the heart. That is to say that the divinity is coming down and the devotee is reaching up. The standard symbol for this is two equilateral triangles, one atop the other. In the West, we call this the Star of David. Another image that one frequently sees in Oriental iconography is of two footprints. Those are the footprints of the divinity. Perhaps you have seen images of Buddha's footprints, which have the symbol of the Dharma chakra, the wheel of law, engraved in the middle of the foot. You can go to Jerusalem and see the place where Muhammad left his footprints on the rock from which he ascended to heaven. It is around this rock that the great al Asqa Mosque was built. There are even little towns in India called the footprints of Vishnu, where Vishnu came down and left his footprint. So the divinity comes down to the level of the heart, and there his footprint is placed. The devotee touches the feet with the hands. One of the greetings to a sage or a monk in India is to take the dust from his feet with your hand. The hand, too, appears in many primitive shrines, in the Paleolithic ordination caves going back as early as 30,000 B.C., one finds handprints of the devotee who touches the realm of divinity. So you can see these powerful archetypes, right? That means they're part of the collective unconscious of humanity and have been operating through our psyches and, and um, reverberating within, 
you know, leading us towards their source for tens of thousands of years. The name of the heart chakra is very interesting. It is called anahata, which means not hit or unstruck. The full translation of its sense is this, the sound that is not made by two things striking together. Perhaps you have heard the Japanese Zen koan, what is the sound of one hand clapping? Well, this is it. The sound that is not made by two things striking together. Every sound that we hear is made by two things striking together. The sound of my voice is made by the wind striking the vocal cords. The sound of the violin is made by the bow rubbing on the string. The sound of a wave is made by the water splashing against the beach, and so it goes. What would the sound be that is not made by two things striking together? It is the sound of Rahman, the Absolute, the energy of which is the, w uh, the world itself is a, a precipitation. Hmm? So it's the world itself is a precipitation of this throb that's not comprised of sound, not comprised of two things having to be struck together. It's the throb of the absolute. As Einstein has told us, energy and mass are the same. The mass is a projection, so to say, of energy in space, or, if you will, a precipitation of energy into matter. The sound of that energy, before it becomes mass, is the sound that is not made by two things striking together. To get a notion of what that sound is, the Indians simply cover their ears. Try it yourself and you can hear it. Actually, we know that this sound, too, is made by two things striking together, namely the blood swirling through the capillaries around your eardrums. But if you don't know that, you might indeed think that was the sound. That sound is OM. You have probably heard the sacred syllable OM, and this is it. This is the sound that is not made by two things striking together. The sound O oh in Sanskrit is analyzed into two sounds, ah and oo, and that is what is known as a diphthong. So this word can be written either as om, as O-M, or as A-U-M, and you'll see it both ways. When one pronounces om, the sound starts in the back of the mouth as an ah. Then it fills the mouth cavity as it goes, oh, right, becomes the ooh on, of the U. And then it closes in the lips in an M, om, oh, right? If this is pronounced correctly, and it's not an easy thing to do, the notion is that you have pronounced all the open sounds that a human mouth can form. Consonants are simply interruptions of that sound, that, right? Consonants are simply an interruption of those vowel sounds, according to this view. In the Sanskrit language, he's not writing about this, the vowel sounds are shaktis. They're the feminine creative power uh, projecting itself. The consonants are masculine that stop it and divide it up. Hmm? So the, the open vowel sounds are the projection of that shakti, the power of the infinite to create, to precipitate this reality of forms. So that all the words and their meanings are simply broken inflections of om, just as all the scattered reflections on that pond that I mentioned are merely broken reflections of the great cosmic image, hmm? the sun reflected off a pond, broken up by the waves. Om is God. Om is God as sound. We usually think of the divine as a form, as an image that we can visualize. But this is the sound aspect of the form that we are going to find when we meet God. It is the sound of God, the sound of the Lord of the world, out of whose thoughts, out of whose being, out of whose energy, substance, the world is a precipitation. Om, the word of words, 
the original logos that we find in the gospel, according to, to John, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God. That word is Om. Hmm? Since Om is the Lord of the world, everything in the world and all the aspects of the world must be somehow understood to be included in Om. To understand it this way, we have to say some things in an allegorical way. Ah, that fine open sound is associated with the waking state of consciousness, the way we experience things when we are awake. Now, when we are awake, the objects that we see are not ourselves. That is to say, the subject of knowledge and the object of knowledge are different from each other. In awaking consciousness, Aristotelian logic prevails. A is not B. I am not what I see. Hmm? Also, the object that we see are what are considered to be made of gross matter. They are made of heavy substance. They are not self-luminous. Rather, they must be illumined from without. You is associated with the dream consciousness. Now, this is quite different realm of awareness altogether. In dream, so he's talking about the dream state, you are either, you are the subject of knowledge, you see the dream, but you also the object of knowledge is your substance that embodies the dream. Though subject and object seem to be different from each other on this stage, they're not. At this point, Aristotelian logic does not work. The subject and object are the same. Furthermore, the objects are subtle objects. They can change form rapidly and effortlessly. Also, they are self-luminous. You don't have to turn a light on to see the objects in your dream. So he's talking about what in the yoga tradition we would call the subtle body. And the state most purely experienced of the subtle body is the dream state. The M is associated with dreamless deep sleep. This is the realm of mystery. Consciousness is there as potential because the person asleep is conscious but unconscious. Hmm? We know, as the king demonstrated to the Brahman in the Upanishadic uh, an uh, anecdote, that if we woke him, there would be consciousness there. It is waiting to come forth again, and it will come forth through either of these two zones, dream and waking. But at this point, it is covered with darkness. Now let us think about that consciousness, which is unconscious. It is conscious of nothing. That is to say, it is not specific. It is not consciousness in relation to any object, either dream object or waking object. That's why the yogis describe the, the deep sleep state. Um, it's going with the causal body and that it is seen as the, uh, defined as the continuous awareness of nothingness. Hmm? What is the fourth syllable in this three-syllable word, om? It is the silence. The silence that is before and after om is pronounced. That is the totality of the word and the world now. You have the silence, that is to say, non-being, and om, which is being. Neither exists without the other. They are mutually interrelated. So this word, when thought about, contains in itself all the mysteries of the world, all in om. However, when you say om, the sound you produce is made by two things striking together. So it is not itself the sound that's not made by two things striking together. Yet by pronouncing OM, by repeating it, you may move your mind toward the point where it will hear the sound that is not made by two things striking together. Once you have heard that sound, you will hear it in all things. This is Kundalini Shakti, is the power of revelation. It, re it reveals the essence of the throb of consciousness that is your being, that is Om. And it takes you past all these concepts, philosophies, into the direct knowing. Mm. 
And once you have heard that sound, you will hear it in all things. Listen to the sound of the city. Listen to the sound of the icebox. Listen to any sounds without personifying them and defining them, and you will hear Om. When Om has been heard, since it is the very sound of your own heart and being, it will enchant you. You will be stilled by it, and you'll hear it everywhere. So there is no need to look anywhere anymore. When you seek, what you seek is here. What you seek is here. Mm. To be heard within all things, the realization of this vibration occurs at the level of the chakra of the heart. Now once the sound om has been heard, one is removed from the call of the lower drives and carried toward the heights, as it were, reaching into the void. One's nature up here is beyond description. This is the ultimate ground of oneself, the Atman. It is identical with Brahman. One reads references to Brahman, Atman, Atman, Brahman. The two are one. In this world of duality, Atman gets distilled inward into the unit known as the individual, the jiva, the individual soul on the inside, while the power outside toward which the soul aims itself is our old friend, Brahman, the Absolute. Mm. From this point on, the ascent of Kundalini, uh, the zeal is to, be, is to cleanse one's consciousness of the interferences of the phenomenal world and come to a direct confrontation with that sound and with the image that is in accord with it. The fifth chakra then, at the level of the larynx, is called Vishuddha. The purgatorial or cleansing one is what it translates as. Here one is trying to uh, eliminate the interposition of the world between oneself and pure Atman and pure Om, or the world uh, uh, between oneself and the divine being of God. That's what's being purged. So when you're talking about purging, it's, it's purging this veil of duality, this, this uh, illusion caused by Shakti the, of separation. That's what's being purged. This is the chakra of the ascetic, of monkish disciplines, he says. Those who reach this level focus their energy into religious zeal, turning that drive that was central in the third chakra to work and oneself conquering one's outward going tendencies, turning all inward, concentrating inward. The Shuddha correlates exactly to our concept of purgation. The passage through the, this chakra is like purgatory, in which one purges oneself of earthly limitations in order to experience the ultimate. This brings one to the next, or the sixth chakra, the Ajna chakra, the third eye. This is the inner sight that perceives the ultimate vision of the Lord of the world, that human form of the divine that transcends the human. Mm. Here, the divine being is made manifest, so to say, in one's own image. At this point, the jiva, the soul, the individual incarnation of Brahman returns to its source and is incarnated again and again, beholds the Lord, Ishwara. And this is what, in our Western terminology, we call heaven. The soul has found its proper love, and so the erotic zeal of the second chakra between the legs has found its true goal in the sixth chakra between the eyes. So love is now exalted as that love for the beloved. This is where the, the images and the forms, Ishwara is like the, the personal form of the divine. For some, it's, you know, it's Krishna. For some, it's Shiva. For some, it's Lord Jesus. For some, it's um, some other form. But it's, it's a form that constellates that energy of the transcendent, the infinite, but has it in form and has us in relationship to it as lover and beloved. 
For the modern Western reader, it will perhaps be a bit disconcerting to find that between the two ways of the yogic solitary and the so-called lover, there is finally very little to choose since the apparent form of the world is burnt to ash and left behind either way. Indeed, the goal of the two yogas is ultimately much the same. The only pertinent question from the point of view of the classic orient is whether what is one, this way or that, is actually that permanent state of realization from which all temporality rolls away as the waves from the leaves, the petals of the lotus. Here within this body are the Ganges and the Jamuna, here Prayag and Banaras, here the sun and the moon. He's quoting the poet saint again. Here within this body are all the sacred places, the seats. The seats of the gods and their approaches. I have not seen a place of pilgrimage or an abode of bliss comparable to my body. Hmm? This is the ecstatic realization. Your body is the temple. You, you, it contains everything from the most finite, contracted forms of the infinite, because they're all infinite shakti. It's Einstein talking, mass is energy, only here it's the divine energy of shakti, of consciousness itself, that forms all the chakras, all the levels of consciousness, until as our consciousness is reunited with its true essential nature, we find we embrace it all. We embody it all. It's all embraced in knowing, loving. Mm. That's the realization. The two spinal nerves at either side of the shishumna, Joseph Campbell goes on to say, left and right are respectively the channels of the female and male energies uh, which the ordered breathing of the yogi is to bring together. That's the Ida and Pingala Nadis that he's talking about. Moreover, Kundalini itself, the coiled serpent power, is conceived as female. Indeed, throughout the broad and colorful domain of Hindu myth and iconography, energy in play, kinetic energy, is conceived and represented as female. So that the word Shakti, meaning energy, power, capacity, strength, connotes also the goddess consort of God, the wife as spiritual consort of the male, and the female organ, the yoni, in relation to the lingam. The kundalini in the muladhara is shakti, is the shakti of good God who dwells in the lotus at the crown of the head with whom she is to be joined. Her voyage up the spine, therefore, is the flight of the awakened girl, burning with desire, kama, through a forest of perils and deceptive allures to her own extinction in fulfillment and fulfillment in extinction, a lover's quest. Comparably, the body of perfection is androgynous, neither wholly male nor wholly female, but combining both. It is represented in certain works of Hindu art as Shiva Ardhna, right? Ardhna, hmm? Ardhna, Ishwar. This is, that's the statue of half Shiva, half Shakti. The half Arda, woman, Nari, of whom the left side is female and the right is male. The yogi is to realize within himself this ideal through an awakening of the power, Shakti, of consciousness. Hmm? It's his own omniscience. Defending it from loss in the forest of allure, and guiding it up the way to the deity of the head, who without it must remain, as it were, a corpse. Sheva. Sheva also means corpse. Right? Dissociated from the energy of life. The male principle is represented, perhaps on the model of Indian life, as the one who would be left alone, the one who would like to be still, but the woman whispers to him of the worlds that they might bring into being, and the corpse, Shiva, becomes Shiva, hmm? the propitious one, the auspicious one. Shiva Shakti then is the image of perfect consciousness in action in the living world. 
But there is another more obvious and natural way of, of achieving Shiva Shakti union, and that is by way of the sacred sexual act itself. And here one need not think of the analogy of God and goddess, since the man and woman themselves supply both the image and the experience. Indeed, throughout the culminating period of Indian art and civilization, this way of sexual or tantric yoga was held by many uh, to be not only the most natural and easy path, but also the most effective. Since hunger and sex, it was claimed, are the fundamental urges of the whole of nature. Suppressing them is unnatural, and continually suppressing them leads only to a state that is rather morbid than sublime. Unnatural strain should not be imposed for the realization of truth, but on the contrary, the path should be followed along which nature itself is pointing. The natural power should be not be annihilated, but amplified, whereupon they will become of themselves transformed and yield the revelation of the other shore. The masculinity of the right side of the body is preponderant in the man, the femininity of the left in the woman, and the rapture of their union, even on the lowest level of its great and soaring scale, is therefore a model and signal of the great delight, the Mahasukha, which is the rapture and nature of being itself, that pure consciousness, Shiva Shakti united, unbound, unlimited by any form. Extreme followers of this way, the so-called Sahajayas, have no gods nor God other than man, who in the strength of his love is divine. Nonetheless, at this level in the ascent of Kundalini, the soul and its beloved, the Lord, are still two. They are distinct. At the sixth chakra, everything is relationship, relationship of I to thee, of the soul to the beloved. Here we behold the divine aim of life, but it is as though there were a cellophane wall between the soul and the object, and perfect love requires that there be no wall. The ultimate goal is to transcend duality, and this is the great point, and it is achieved only at the crown of the head, the seventh chakra, the sahasrara, the thousand-petal lotus. Once the kundalini has arrived at this pinnacle, the dividing membrane is withdrawn from between the soul and its beloved, and both are gone. For there is, uh, for there to be an object, there must be a subject of knowledge and a relationship between them. So with the membrane withdrawn, that's the veil removed, hmm, both the soul and God are extinguished, joined beyond duality, beyond the pairs of opposites. There one finds what we in our language can only call identity. And yet it can't be called identity because it is beyond categories altogether. It is this that I want to speak about. With this passage across the line of mystery between the sixth and seventh chakras, something impossible to think of takes place. Hmm? Namely, all phenomenology, all phenomenology is transcended. And with that, all subjectivity as well. Schopenhauer speaks of this in the world as will and representation. He says, if we could only understand how it is that that which is one becomes many. How that which is no thing becomes things. He calls this paradox the world not. If we could understand that, we would understand all. But it cannot be understood. Not by the mind. This is the impenetrable mystery. That's why at the center of the Mahakali Yantra, there is a black dot. That's the mystery. That's the stopping point of the mind. That bindu is, this is the last realm of, the, of any subject-object split here. To go to there, gone, swaha, 
Hmm? The yogis you'll see with these three uh, ashes, sacred ash lines across their head, um, symbolizing that the world of objective existence made of the three gunas has been burnt to ash. Hmm? All that's left is unity. Hmm? That's, that's the aim of spiritual life. That's the aim of sadhana. It's the aim of all the practices. Hmm? That's also what I wrote about, obviously, in The Soul's Journey, Guidance from the Divine Within. All about this, the journey of our self from limited, ordinary existence to reclaiming the knowledge, the wisdom, the direct knowing of our sublime, infinite nature. Regardless of what we call it, Christ consciousness, Buddha mind, bodhicitta, uh, Shiva shakti, doesn't matter. Those are all names. They belong to the realm of name and form. We go beyond name and form to know the infinite as our own self. And the sound form of the divine is a gift, a vehicle of shakti to take us there. That is mantra. That is om. That is om kalima. When we chant Om Kalima, we are drenching the entire body, the entire subtle body, the entire causal body in the throb of the infinite, in sound form and in just the throb of consciousness itself. Because as we become absorbed in mantra, the sound form disappears. Mm? When we sit in the stillness of meditation, even if we're silently repeating it, that subtle body, Om Kalima, Om Kalima, silently in the mind, that becomes suddenly an awareness of just simply being, being all. Mm. Now it's a throb of awareness. It doesn't even have a thought form. Mm. We've moved from the chanting of sound form to thought form. We're going to go beyond that into that domain of transcendence, that domain of direct knowing, that domain of the truth of who you are. So we're going to chant now. We're going to be chanting Om Kali Ma, Kali Namo Nama. And we'll chant for a few minutes and then just sit in that stillness and delight. And whatever unfolds is a gift from your own divine self coming through the vehicle of mantra. Shri Kali Man Devi Ki
this prayer, then may all our practices truly benefit everyone, and may all beings know complete freedom from suffering. Uh, namaste. Om Matakali, the Divine Mother, the Great Shakti, hmm? the Great Mother. She who becomes the seeker and the sought, the teacher and the taught, playing at two, oh mother, but always you, it's always one, it's all there is, and that's what we're coming home to, that knowing, beyond the mind, the mind is an instrument for knowing differences, that's what it that's what it creates. That's its domain. So we have to leave the mind behind, pass through that dark void into the pure light of consciousness. It's all embracing, all loving the truth of who you are, what all this is, what all beings are. So I want to thank you for coming this evening and being ones who are engaged in practices, engaged in contemplation, engaged in the self-empowerment that comes through that so that you can walk these highest truths, the state of that loving, compassionate, knowing, walk that into the world, into our everyday lives. So thank you for being ones who are doing that. You know, I thank you for the ways that you support Anankara through, through donations, um, through liking our videos and liking and commenting on the books on Amazon or Barnes & Noble. These are all ways that support uh, our simple mission to make everything available and known to anyone who encounters it. So thank you for supporting that as well. And I look forward to seeing you again in two weeks. Namaste.